Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea, by a perpetual decree, that it cannot pass it? And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail? Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it? But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. God's Barriers Against Man's Sin A sermon delivered on Lord's Day morning, November the 16th, 1856, by C. H. Spurgeon. The majesty of God is displayed in creation and providence, ought to stir up our hearts in adoring wonder, and melt them down in willing obedience to His commands. The almighty power of Jehovah, so clearly manifest in the works of his hands, should constrain us, his creatures, to fear his name and prostrate ourselves in humble reverence before his throne. When we know that the sea, however tempestuous, is entirely submissive to the behests of God, that when he saith, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, it dares not encroach. The pride of its waves is stayed. When we know that God bridles the tempest, though nature rocks beneath his tread, and curbs the boisterous storm, he ought to be feared. Verily he is a God before whom it is no dishonour for us to bow ourselves in the very dust. The contemplation of the marvellous works which he doth upon the great and wide sea, where he tosseth the waves to and fro, and yet keepeth them in their ordained courses, should draw forth our devoutest emotions, and I could almost say, inspire us with homage. Great art thou, O Lord God, greatly art thou to be praised. Let the world which thou hast made, and all that therein is, declare thy glory. I can scarcely conceive a heart so callous that it feels no awe, or a human mind so dull and destitute of understanding as fairly to view the tokens of God's omnipotent power, and then turn aside, without some sense of the fitness of obedience. One might think the impression would be spontaneous in every breast, and if not, only let reason do her office, and by slower process every mind should yet be convinced. Let your eyes behold the stars. God alone can tell their numbers, yet he calls them all by names. By him they are marshalled in their spheres, and travelled through the aerial universe just as he gives them charge. They are all his servants, who with cheerful haste perform the bidding of their Lord. You see how the stormy wind and tempest, like slaves, obey his will, and you know that the great pulse of ocean throbs and vibrates with its ebb and flow entirely under his control. Have these great things of God, these wondrous works of him, no lesson to teach us? Do they not, while declaring his glory, reveal our duty? Our poets, both the sacred and the uninspired, have feigned consciousness to those inanimate agents, that they might the more truthfully represent their honourable service. But if because we are rational and intelligent beings, we withhold our allegiance from our rightful sovereign, then our privileges are a curse, and our glory is a shame. Alas, then, that the instincts of men very often guide them to act by impulse, more wisely than they commonly do by settled conviction. Where is the man that will not bend the knee in time of tempest? Where is the man that does not acknowledge God when he hears the terrible voice of his deep-toned thunder, and sees with alarm the shafts of his lightning fly abroad, cleaving the thick darkness of the atmosphere? In times of plague, famine, and pestilence, men are prone to take refuge in religion. They will make confession, like Pharaoh, when he said, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. But like him, when the rain and the hail and the thunders have ceased, when the plagues are removed, then they sin yet more, and their hearts are hardened. Hence their sin becomes exceeding sinful, 
since they sin against truths which even nature itself teaches us are most just. We might learn, even without the written oracles of Scripture, that we ought to obey God, if our foolish hearts were not so darkened. Thus unbelief of the Almighty Creator is a crime of the first magnitude. If it were a petty sovereign against whom ye rebelled, it might be pardonable. If he were a man like yourselves, he might expect that your faults would easily find forgiveness. But since he is the God who reigns alone, where clouds and darkness are round about him, the God to whom all nature is obedient, and whose high behests are obeyed both in heaven and in hell, it becomes a crime, the terrible character of which words cannot portray that you should ever sin against a God so marvellously great. The greatness of God enhances the greatness of our sin. I believe this is one lesson which the prophet intended to teach us by the text. He asks us in the name of God, or rather, God asks us through him, Fear ye not me, saith the Lord? Will ye not tremble at my presence? But while it is a lesson, I do not think it is the lesson of the text. There is something else which we are to learn from it. God here contrasts the obedience of the strong, the mighty, the untamed sea with the rebellious character of his own people. The sea, saith he, obeys me. It never breaks its boundary. It never leapeth from its channel. It obeys me in all its movements. But man, poor, puny man, the little creature whom I could crush as the moth, will not be obedient to me. The sea obeys me from shore to shore, without reluctance, and its ebbing floods, as they retire from its bed, each of them says to me, in the voices of the pebbles, O Lord, we are obedient to thee, for thou art our master. But my people, says God, are a revolting and a rebellious people. They go astray from me. And is it not, my brethren, a marvellous thing, that the whole earth is obedient to God save man, even the mighty Leviathan, who maketh the deep to be hoary, sinneth not against God, but his course is ordered according to his almighty master's decree. Stars, those wondrous masses of light, are easily directed by the very wish of God. Clouds, though they seem erratic in their movement, have God for their pilot. He maketh the clouds his chariot. And the winds, though they seem restive beyond control, yet do they blow or cease to blow, just as God willeth. In heaven, on earth, even in the lower regions, I had almost said we could scarcely find such a disobedience as that which is practised by man. At least in heaven there is a cheerful obedience, and in hell there is a constrained submission to God, while on earth, Man makes the base exception. He is continually revolting and rebelling against his Maker. Still there is another thought in the text, and this I shall endeavour to dilate upon. Let us read it again. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord? Will ye not tremble at my presence? Now here is the pith of the matter, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass it, and though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it. But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. The sea, says God, is not only obedient, but it is rendered obedient by the restraint merely of sand. It is not the rock of adamant that restrains the sea one half so easily as just that little belt of sand and shingle which preserves the dry land from the inundations of the ocean. The sea obeys me, and has for its only check the sand. And yet, says he, my people, though they have restraints the strongest that reason could imagine, are a revolting and a rebellious people, and scarcely can my commands, my promises, my love, my judgment, my providence, or my word restrain them from sin. That is the point we shall dwell upon this morning. The sea is restrained by a belt of sand, but we, notwithstanding all the restraints of God, 
are a people bent on revolting from him. The doctrine of the text seems to me to be this, that without supernatural means God can make all creatures obedient save man. But man is so disobedient in his heart that only some supernatural agency can make him obedient to God, while the simple agency of sand can restrain the sea without any stupendous effort of divine power more than he ordinarily puts out in nature. He cannot thus make man obedient to his will. Now, my brethren, let us look back into history and see if it has not been so. What has been a greater problem, if we may so speak, concerning the divine mind, than that of restraining men from sin? How many restraints God has put upon man! Adam is in the garden, pure and holy. He has restraints that one would think strong enough to prevent he is committing a sin so contemptible and apparently unprofitable as that by which he fell. He is to have the whole garden in perpetuity, if he will not eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. His God will walk with him and make him his friend. Moreover, in the cool of the day he shall hold converse with angels and with the Lord, the master of angels. And yet he dares eat of that holy fruit, which God had set forth not to be touched by man, then he must die. One would think it was enough to promise reward for obedience and punishment for sin. But no, the check fails. Man, left to his own free will, touches the fruit and he falls. Man cannot be restrained, even in his purity, so easily as the mighty sea. Since that time... Mark what God has done by way of restraint. The world has become corrupt. It is altogether covered with iniquity. Forth comes a prophet. Enoch prophesies of the coming of the Lord, declaring that he sees him coming with ten thousand of his saints to judge the world. That world goes on, as profane and unheeding as before. Another prophet is raised up and cries, Yet a little while, and this earth shall be drowned in a flood of water. Do men cease from sin? No. Profligacy, crime, iniquities of the vilest class are as prevalent as before. Man rushes on to his destruction. The deluge comes and destroys all but a favoured few. The new family goes out to people the earth. Will not the world now be clean and holy? Wait a little and ye shall see. One of these men will do a deed which shall render him a curse for ever, and his son Canaan shall in after years inherit his father's curse. Not long after that you see Sodom and Gomorrah devoured with fire, which God rains out of heaven. But what of this? What though in later years Pharaoh and his chariots are drowned in the Red Sea? What though Sennacherib and his hosts perish at midnight by the blast of an archangel? What though the world reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man, being drunken with the wine of God's wrath? What though the earth be scarred and burned by war? What though it be deluged with floods? What though it be oppressed with famines, pestilences and diseases? She still goes on in the same manner. At this hour the world is a sinful, rebellious world, and until God shall work a work in our day, such as we shall scarce believe, though a man tell it to us, the world shall never be pure and holy. The sea is restrained by sand. We admire the beautiful poetic fact. But man, being naturally more ungovernable than the storm, and more impetuous than the ocean, is not to be tamed. He will not bend his neck to the Lord, nor will he be obedient to the God of the whole earth. But what of this fact, you say? We know it is true, we do not doubt it. Stay a while. I am now coming to deal with your hearts and consciences, and may the Holy Spirit help me in doing so. I shall divide as God would divide them, saints and sinners. First of all, ye saints, I have a word to say to you. I want you to look at this as a doctrine 
not more evident in the history of mankind at large than abundantly verified in your own case. Come now, I want to ask of you this morning whether it cannot be said of you truly, the sea is bound by sand, but I am one of those people who are bent on revolting from God, neither can any of his restraints keep me from sin. Let us review for a few moments the various restraints which God has put upon his people to keep them from sins, which nevertheless are altogether ineffectual without the accompanying power of irresistible grace. First then remember there is a restraint of gratitude, which to the lowly, regenerated heart must necessarily form a very strong motive to obedience. I can conceive of nothing that ought so much to prompt me to obedience as the thought that I owe so much to God. O heir of heaven, thou canst look back to eternity and see thy name in life's fair book set down. Thou canst sing of electing love. Thou dost believe that a covenant was made with Christ in thy behalf, and that thy salvation was made secure in that moment when the hands of the Eternal Son grasped the stylus and signed his name as the representative of all the elect. Thou believest that on Calvary thy sins were all atoned for. Thou hast in thy soul the conviction that thy sins, past, present, and to come, were all numbered on the scapegoat's head of old, and carried away for ever. Thou believest that neither death nor hell can ever divide thee from thy Saviour's breast. Thou knowest that there is laid up for thee a crown of life which fadeth not away, and thine expectant soul anticipates that with branches of palms in thine hands, with crowns of gold on thy head, and streets of gold beneath thy feet, thou shalt be happy for ever. Thou believest thyself to be one of the favoured of heaven, a special object of divine solicitation. Thou thinkest that all things work together for thy good. Yea, thou art persuaded that everything in providence has a special regard to thee and to thy favoured brethren. I ask thee, O saint, is not this a bond strong enough to keep thee from sin? If it were not for the desperate unstableness of thy heart, Wouldst thou not be restrained from sin by this? Is not thy sin exceeding sinful, because it is sin against electing love, against redeeming peace, against all surpassing mercy, against matchless affection, against sureless grace, against spotless love? Ah, sin has reached its climax, when it dares to sin against such love as this. O Christian, thine affection to thy Lord and Master should restrain thee from iniquity. And is it not a fearful proof of the terrible character of thine heart, of thine heart even now, for still thou hast evil remaining in it, that all the ties of gratitude are still incapable of keeping thee from unholiness? The sins of yesterday rise to thy memory now. O oh, look back on them! Do they not tell thee that thou dost sin most ungratefully? O oh, saint, didst thou not yesterday use thy master's name in vain? And not thy master's only, but thy father's name? Hadst thou not yesterday an unbelieving heart? Was thou not petulant when girded with favours that ought to make a living man unwilling to complain? Was thou not, when God hath forgiven thee ten thousand talents, angry with thy neighbour, who owed thee a hundred pence? Ah, Christian, thou art not yet free from sin, nor wilt thou be, until thou hast washed thy garments in death's black stream, and then thou shalt be holy, as holy as the glorified and pure and spotless, even as the angels around the throne but not till then. I ask thee, O saint, viewing thy sins as sins against love and mercy, against covenant promises, covenant oaths, covenant engagements, ay, and covenant fulfilments, is not thy sin a desperate thing? And art not thou thyself a rebellious and revolting being, seeing that thou canst not be restrained by such a barrier of adamant as thy soul acknowledges? 
Next notice that the saint has not only this barrier against sin, but many others. He has the whole of God's word given him by way of warning. Its pages he is accustomed to read. He reads there that if he break the statutes and keep not the commandments of the Lord, his father will visit his transgressions with a rod and his iniquity with stripes. He has before him in God's word abundant examples. He finds a David going with broken bones to his grave after his sin. He finds a Samson shorn of his locks and with his eyes put out. He sees proof upon proof that sin will find a man out, that the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Abundant warnings there are for the child of God, not of saints who have perished, for we have none such on record in Scripture, and none ever shall finally perish. But we have many warnings of great and grievous damages, sustained by God's own children, when they have sailed out of their proper course. And yet, O Christian, against all warning and against all precept, thou darest to sin? O oh, art thou not a rebellious creature? And mayest thou not this morning humble thyself at the thought of the greatness of thine iniquity? Again, the saint sins against his own experience. When he looks back upon his past life, he finds that sin has always been a loss to him. He has never found any profit, but is always lost by it. He remembers such and such a transgression. It appeared sweet to him at the time, but, oh, it made his master withdraw his presence and hide his face. The saint can look back on the time when sin hung like a millstone round his neck, and he felt the terrible flame of remorse burning in his soul, and knew how evil a thing and bitter it is to sin against God. And yet the saint sins. Now if the unconverted man sins, he does not sin against his own experience, for he has not had that true heartfelt experience that renders sin exceeding sinful. But every time thou sinnest, O grey-headed saint, thou sinnest with a vengeance, for thou hast had all through thy life so much proof of what sin has been to thee. Thou hast not been deceived about it, for thou hast felt its bitterness in thy bowels, and when thou sippest the accursed draught, thou art infatuated indeed, because thou sinnest against experience. I am the youngest of the saints. Have you not been made to taste the bitterness of sin? I know you have, if you are saints. And will you go and dip your fingers in the nauseous cup? Will you put the poisoned goblet to your lips again? Yes, you will. But because you do so in the teeth of your experience, it ought to make you weep that you should be such desperate rebels against such a loving God, who has put not merely a barrier of sand, but a barrier of tried steel, to keep in your lusts, and yet they will break forth. Verily ye are a rebellious and revolting people. Then again, God guards all his children with providence in order to keep them from sin. I could tell you even from the little experience I have had of spiritual things, many cases in which I feel I have been kept from sin by divine providence. There have been seasons when the strong hand of sin has appeared for a while to get the mastery over us, and we have been dragged along by some strong, inherent lust, which we were prone to practice before our regeneracy. We were intoxicated with the lust. We remember how pleasurable it was to us in the days of our iniquity, how we reveled in it, till we were on a sudden drag to the very edge of the precipice, and we looked down. Our brain reeled. We could not stand. And do we not remember how just then some striking providence came in our way and saved us, or else we should have been excommunicated from the church for violating the rules of propriety? Ah, strange things happen to some of us. Strange things have happened to some of you. It was only a providence which on some sad and solemn occasion, to which you never look back without regret, saved you from sin which would have been a scab on your character. Bless God for that. 
But remember, notwithstanding the girdings of his providence, how many times you have offended. And let the frequency of your sin remind you that you must indeed be a rebellious creature. Though he has afflicted you, you have sinned. Though he has given you chastisement, you have sinned. Though he has put you in the furnace, yet the dross has not departed from you. Oh, how corrupt your hearts are, and how prone you are still to wander, notwithstanding all the barriers God has given you to encompass you. Yet once more let me remind you, beloved, that the ordinances of God's house are all intended to be checks to sin. He girds us by the worship of the sanctuary. He girds us by the remembrance of our holy baptism. And all else that is connected with Christianity is intended to check us from sin. And great are the effects which these produce, yet all are insufficient without the preserving grace of God, given to us day by day. Let us think, beloved, too, that God has given to us a tender conscience, more tender than the conscience of worldly men, because he has given us living consciences, whereas theirs are often seared and dead. And yet against this living conscience, against the warnings of the Spirit, against precept, against promise, against experience, against the honour of God and against the gratitude they owe Him, the saints of God have dared to sin, and they must confess before Him that they are rebellious and have revolted from Him. Bow down your heads with shame while ye consider your ways, and then lift up your hearts, Christians, in adoring love that he has kept you when your feet were making haste to hell, where you would have gone, but for his preserving grace. Shall not this long-suffering of your God, this tender compassion, be your theme every day? While life and thought and being last, or immortality endures. Will you not pray that God should not cast you away, nor take his Holy Spirit from you, though you are a rebellious creature, and though you have revolted against him. This is for the saints, and now may the Spirit help me while I strive to apply it to sinners. Sinner, I have solemn things to say to thee this morning. Lend me for a few minutes thy very closest attention. I will speak to thee as though this were the last message I should ever deliver in thine ear. I have asked my God that I may so speak to thee, O sinner, that if I win not thy heart, I may at least be free from thy blood, and that if I am not able to convince thee of thy sin, I may at any rate make thee without excuse in that day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Come then, sinner. In the first place I bid thee consider thy guilt. Thou hast heard what I have said. The mighty ocean is kept in obedience by God, and restrained within its channel by simple sand. And thou, a pitiful worm, the creature of a day, the ephemera of an hour, thou art a rebel against God. The sea obeys him, thou dost not. Consider, I beseech thee, how many restraints God has put on thee. He has not checked thy lusts with sand, but with towering cliffs, and yet thou hast burst through every bound in the violence of thy transgressions. Perhaps he has checked thy soul by the remembrance of thy guilt. Thou hast this morning felt thyself a despiser of God, or if not a despiser, thou art a mere hearer, and hast no part nor lot in this matter. Dost thou not remember thy sins in the face of thy mother's counsels and thy father's strong admonitions? Do they never check thee? Dost thou never think thou seest a mother's tears coming after thee? Hast thou never heard a father's prayer for thee, when thou hast been spending thy nights in dissipation, and hast gone home late to thy bed? Hast thou never thought thou hast seen thy father's spirit at thy bedside, offering one more prayer for an Absalom, his son, or for an Ishmael, his rebellious child? Consider what thou hast learned, child, Baptized with a mother's tears, almost immersed in them, thou wast early taught to know something of God. Then thou didst go from thy mother's knees, thou wentest to those of a pious teacher. Thou wast trained in a Sabbath school, 
or at any rate thou was taught to read the Bible. Thou knowest the threatenings of God. It is no new tale to thee, when I warn thee that sinners must be condemned. It is no new story when I tell thee that saints shall wear the starry crown. Thou knowest all this. Consider then how great is thy guilt. Thou hast sinned against light and knowledge. Thou art not the heathen sinner who sits in darkness, but thou art a sinner before high heaven in the full light of day. Thou hast not sinned ignorantly. Thou hast done it when thou knewest better. And when thou comest to be lost, thou shalt have an additional doom, because thou didst know thy duty, but thou didst it not. I charge that home upon thee, I charge it solemnly upon thy conscience. Is it true, or is it not? Some of you have had other things. Don't you remember? Some little time ago, when sickness was rife, you were stretched on your bed. One night you will never forget. Sickness had got strong hold of you, and the strong man bowed himself. Do you not remember what a sight you had then of the regions of the damned? Not with your eyes, but with your conscience. You thought you heard their shrieks. You thought you would be amongst them yourself soon. Methinks I see you. You turned your face to the wall, and you cried, O God, if thou wilt save my life, I will give myself to thee. Perhaps it was an accident. Thou didst fear that death was very near. The terrors of death laid hold of thee, and thou didst cry, O God, let me but reach home in safety. And my bended knees and my tears pouring in torrents shall prove that I am sincere in the vow I make. But didst thou perform that vow? Nay, thou hast sinned against God. Thy broken vows have gone before thee to judgment. Dost thou think it a little thing to make a promise to thy fellow creature and break it? It may be so in thine estimation, but not so in that of honest men. But dost thou think it a little thing to promise to thy Maker and to break thy promise? There is no light penalty when we sin against the Almighty God. It will cost thee thy soul, man, and thy soul's blood for ever, if thou goest on in this fashion. Vow and pay, or if thou payest not, vow not, for God shall visit those vows upon thee in the day when he maketh inquisition for blood, and destroyest thy soul. Thou hast been guarded thus. Remember that thou hast had extraordinary deliverances. The disease did not kill thee. Thy broken bones were healed. Thou didst not die. When the jaws of death were uplifted, they did not close upon thee. Here thou art still. Thy life is spared. O oh, my dear hearers, some of you are the worst. You have regularly sat in these pews. God is my witness how earnestly I have longed for you all in the bowels of Christ. I have not shunned to declare the whole counsel of God to you. If I had been a time-server and kept back part of the truth, much more honour would I have received from men than I have received. But I have cleared my conscience, I trust, from your blood. How many times have I seen men and women cry, the hot tears, falling down their cheeks in quick succession, and expected that I should have seen a change in some of your lives, but how many of you there are who have gone on sinning against warnings, which I am sure, though they may have been excelled in eloquence, have never been excelled in heartiness. Do you think it a little thing to sin against God's ambassador? It is no little sin. Every time we sin against the warnings we have received, we sin so much the more heinously. But there are some, I had hope for you, but ye have gone back to the ways of perdition. I have cried, Turn ye, turn ye, why will ye die? But I have been obliged to go to my master with that exclamation, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! It were better for thee that thou hadst been Tyre and Sidon, than that thou shouldest have been left in the midst of privileges, if thou shouldest perish at last. Woe unto you, hearers of New Park Street! Woe unto you that listen not to the voice of the minister here! If ye perish beneath our warnings, ye shall perish in a horrible manner. Woe unto thee, Capernaum! Thou art exalted unto heaven, but thou shalt be cast down to hell. Woe unto thee, young woman! 
Thou hast had a pious mother, and thou hast had many warnings. Woe unto thee, young man! Thou hast been a profligate youth. Thou hast been brought to this house of prayer from thine infancy, and thou art sitting there, even now. Does not thy conscience prick thee? Often does thy conscience prick thee. Often thy heart has told thee that thou art wrong, and yet thou art still unchanged. Woe unto thee! Woe unto thee! And yet I will cry unto my God that he would advert that woe and pardon thee, that he would not let thee die, but bring thee unto himself, lest now ye perish in your sins. Ye sinners, God has a controversy with you. He tames the sea, but ye will not be tamed. Nothing but his marvellous grace exerted in you will ever check you in your lusts. You have sinned against warnings and reproofs, against providences, mercies and judgments, and still ye sin. O oh, my hearers, when you sin, you do not sin so cheaply as others, for when you sin, you sin in the very teeth of hell. There is not a man or woman in this place, I am sure, who when he or she sins does not know that hell is the inevitable consequence. Sirs, ye do not sin in the dark. When God shall give you the wages of your iniquity, you shall not be able to say to God, I did not know this would be the pay for my labour. When thou didst sow tares, thou couldst not expect that thou shouldest reap wheat. Thou knewest that they who sow carnal things shall reap carnal things. Thou art sowing to the flesh, but not with the hope that thou wilt reap salvation. For thou knowest that he who soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Sinner, it is a dreadful thing to sin, when God puts hell before thee. What sin when he has given out his threatening? Sin while Sinai is thundering, while hell is blazing? Aye, that is to sin indeed. But how many of you, my dear hearers, have sinned like this? I would to God he would turn this house into a bockim, that you might weep over your guilt. It is the hardest thing in the world to make men believe their guilt. If we could once get them to do that, we should find that Christ would reveal to them his salvation. I cannot with my poor voice and my weak utterance even bring you to think that it is Christ Jesus in the ministry of his Spirit who can give you a true and real sense of your sin. Hath he done so? Hath he blessed my words to any of you? Do any of you feel your sins? Do any of you know that you are rebellious? Do you say from this time forth you will mend your ways? Sirs, let me tell you, you cannot do that. Are you better than the mightiest of men? The best of men are but men at the best, and they are convinced that they cannot tame their own turbulent passions. God saith that the sea can be tamed with sand, but the heart of man cannot be restrained, it is still rebelling. Dost thou think thou canst do that which God saith is impossible? Dost thou suppose thyself stronger than God Almighty? What canst thou change thine own heart, when God declares that we must be born again from above, or else we cannot see the kingdom of heaven? Others have tried to do it, but they cannot. I beseech thee, do not try to do it with thine own strength. I am glad thou knowest thy guilt, but, oh, do not increase that guilt by seeking to wash it out in the foul stream of thine own resolutions. Go and tell God that thou knowest thy sin, and confess it before him, and ask him to create in thee a clean heart, and renew in thee a right spirit. Tell him thou knowest that thou art rebellious, and that thou art sure that thou always wilt be, unless he change thy heart. And I beseech thee, rest not satisfied until thou hast a new heart. My hearer, be not content with baptism, be not content with the Lord's Supper, be not content with shutting up your shop on Sunday, be not content with leaving off drunkenness, be not content with giving up swearing. Remember, you may do all that and be damned, it is a new heart and a right spirit you want. Begin with that, and when you have that, all the rest will come right. 
Bethink thee, my hearer, thou mayest varnish and gild thyself, but thou canst never change thyself. Thou mayest moralise, but thou canst never spiritualise thy heart. But just bethink thee, thou art this morning lost. And just think of this, thou canst do nothing whatever to save thyself. Let that thought rise in thy soul, and lay thee very low. And when thou goest to God, cry, O Lord, do what I cannot do. Save me, O my God, for thy mercy's sake. My dear hearers, I have spoken harshly to you. Or will you rather take it in love? Ye who have sinned thus terribly against God, do ye feel it? Well, I have no grace to offer to thee, I have no Christ to offer to thee, but I have Christ to preach to thee. Oh, what shall I say? This, you are a sinner. It is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, even the chief. Art thou a sinner? Then he came to save thee. O oh, joyful sound! I am ready to leap in the pulpit for very joy, to have this to preach to thee. I can clap my hands with ecstasy of heart, that I am allowed again to tell thee it is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Let me tell you that when he came into this world, he was nailed to the cross, and that there he expired in desperate grief and agony, and there he shrieked, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There the blood ran from his hands and feet, and because he suffered, he is able to forgive. Sinner, dost thou believe that? Thou art black. Dost thou believe in the face of thy blackness that Christ's blood can make thee white? What sayest thou, sinner? God has convinced thee of thy sin. Art thou willing to be saved in God's way this morning? If thou art willing, thou shalt be saved. It is written, Whosoever will, let him come. Art thou thirsty this morning? Come hither and drink. Art thou hungry? Come and eat. Art thou dying? Come and live. My master bids me tell you, all you who feel your sins, that you are forgiven. All you who know your transgressions, he bids me tell you this. I, even I, am he that blotteth out your transgressions for my name's sake. Hast thou been an adulterer? Hast thou been a whoremonger, a thief, a drunkard, a Sabbath-breaker, a swearer? I find no exception to this proclamation. Whosoever will, let him come. I find no exception in this. Him that cometh I will in no wise cast out. Dost thou know thy guilt? Then I do not ask thee what thy guilt is. Though thou wert the vilest creature, again I tell thee, if thou knowest thy guilt, Christ will forgive thee. Believe it, and thou art saved. And now will ye go away and forget all this? Some of you have wept this morning. No wonder. The wonder is that we do not all weep until we find ourselves saved. You will go away tomorrow to your farms and to your merchandise, to your shops and to your offices, and the impression that may have been produced on you this Sabbath morning will pass away like the morning cloud. My hearers, I would not weep. Though you should call me all the names you can think of, but I will weep, because you will not weep for yourselves. Sinners, why will ye be damned? Is it a pleasant thing to revolt in the flames of hell? Sirs, what profit is there in your death? What, is it an honourable thing to rebel against God? Is it an honour to stand and be the scorn of God's universe? Dost thou say thou shalt not die, yet thou wilt put it off a little while? Sinner, thou wilt never have a more convenient season. If today is inconvenient, tomorrow will be more so. Put it off today, wipe away the tears from your eyes, and the day may come when you would give a million worlds for a tear. But you shall not be able to get one. Many a man has had a soft heart. It is passed away, and in after years he has said, Oh, that I could but shed a tear. O oh God, make thy word like a hammer this morning, that it may break the rocky heart in pieces. 
Ye who know your sins, as God's ambassador I beseech you, be ye reconciled unto God. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Remember, once lost, ye are lost for ever. But if ye are once saved, ye are certainly saved for ever. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, said Paul of old. Jesus himself hath said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. I will not finish with a curse. He that believeth shall be saved. God give you all an interest in that eternal blessing, for the Lord Jesus' sake. Amen.